Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending. I very much appreciate it. Today, I will talk about the pathophysiologic response of the obstructed ureter, and it is my pleasure to give an insight to our basic translational research. We've been studying the underlying inflammatory response. I've included two pictures. <laughs> this on the left is my university at home where I'm working and uh, on the right, just a picture from my hometown in Bochum. This is today's outline. Um, Dr. Chu provided me with a clinical case. I will briefly talk about the etiology of hydronephrosis, review morphological and functional changes of the obstructed ureter following um, obstruction. We will explore the inflammatory response of the ureter to obstruction and finally discuss clinical implications of uh, hydroureteric conditions. Uh, this is a KUB of a 68-year-old um, woman. She presented um, with a left centimeter proximal stone, um, was asymptomatic and uh, ultrasound was not available. Uh, she was planned for ESWL and after ESWL, um, there was no change visible. The stone was uh, still there. So um, um, this ultrasound, uh, was completed and we saw a, a massive hydronephrosis and this CT um, um, showed that there is a massive um, decrease of parenchyma and um, chronic hydronephrosis due to that stone. Stones but also tumors, infections um, and trauma can cause intramural, extramural or mural obstruction and thereby hydronephrosis and a hydroureter. The most common cause um, are stones and the severity usually depends on the degree and duration of obstruction. Um, the most common cause for upper urinary tract obstruction are um, urethral calculi. The incidence for urethysis is seven to 13 and five to 9% in North America and Europe and gradually increased over the last decades. And stone patients with symptomatic colics develop hydronephrosis in about 89% of cases. Timely and appropriate management of acute kidney obstruction prevents long-term kidney damage. Um, but despite adequate treatment, hydronephrosis may persist even after the relief of the obstructing cause, especially in cases of chronic obstruction, um, just like we saw that in the clinical case. Um, although uh, urethral is obstruction is a condition we face daily, the pathophysiologic changes of the ureter are insufficiently described in literature. And the long-term impact of urethral obstruction on the ureter has been largely overlooked. Current knowledge uh, mostly originates from animal trials and many publications date back to 40 years ago. Just like this um, were published by Weiss in 1976. They studied urethral changes um, following obstruction um, and they induced in uh, urethral obstruction in rabbits for up to eight days. These two plots show the intraluminal pressure um, and the diameter of the ureter on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. And they show that in case of urethral obstruction, um, the urine outlet is blocked and causes an increase of pelvic pressure. Uh, the intraluminal pressure then peaks after a few hours and stabilizes. Unlike uh, the diameter of the ureter, which increases um, and uh, with time, a hydroureter develops. This work by the same group had a closer look at contractile properties and the compensatory mechanisms to obstruction. And they showed that ureteral obstruction impairs efficient peristalsis. Again, rabbits had to undergo urethral obstruction, uh, in this case for two weeks. The urethral dimensions increased considerably, the length by 24% and the diameter by 100%. But the ureter did not just decompensate, but rather undergo changes. Um, muscle hypertrophy was present and the cross-sectional muscle area increased by almost 250%. And also peak uh, active forces increased twofold. Despite muscle hypertrophy and decreased contractility, urine flow in the obstructed ureter was impaired. 
And the authors employed the Laplace relation to, um, to describe the underlying me mechanism. Urethral contractions are less able to grab the urethral wall due to a decreased ratio of um, wall thickness to diameter, and hence the ability to generate contractile pressure required for urine flow is decreased. This is a more recent publication. Um, it addressed histomorphological and functional changes. They induced a chronic partial obstruction in guinea pigs by transplanting the ureter into the psoas muscle for two to six months. Histological examination showed um, an increased thickness of the muscle layer proximal to the obstruction. Uh, the figure on the right shows um, in A, um, nerve fibers in a normal ureter. And uh, this um, um, is a ureter that's been obstructed for six months and there's a rarification disorientation of nerve fibers. Interestingly, uh, they found an increase of connective tissue proximal and distal to the obstruction, possibly associated with a local inflammatory response. I would like to talk about the electrical propagation of peristaltic waves briefly. Um, under normal conditions, urethral peristalsis originates uh, with electric activity at pacemaker sites located in the proximal portion of the urinary collecting system. The electric activity is then propagated distally and gives rise to urethral contractions, which then propel a bolus of urine distally. Efficient propulsion of the urine bolus depends on the ureter's ability to completely grab its walls. Hamad and co-workers studied propagation of peristalsis in obstructed ureters. In order, uh, they completely or partially obstructed red ureters, and after 24 hours, obstruction was released. The electrical activity was recorded um, in the obstructed and contralateral ureter using um, this high-resolution 64 extracellular electrode probe. They recorded the frequency and the velocity of electrical impulses before, during, and after obstruction. In the left, which was the obstructed ureter, and um, in the right ureter. The gray area displays the time of uh, obstruction. Um, the black curve is complete obstruction and in light blue, partial urethral obstruction. After complete or um, partial obstruction, there was an immediate significant um, change in propagation of ele uh, electric impulses in the proximal and distal ureter. Um, in the proximal part of the obstructed ureter, there's an immediate increase in frequency followed by a decrease. Um, and those changes gradually disappeared over two weeks. In general, the changes were similar between partial and complete obstruction, however, more pronounced in complete obstruction. Interestingly, uh, they also um, observed changes in the contralateral ureter. And authors discussed that possible mechanisms might be neural mechanisms or humor factors might be involved. Based on the morphological and functional changes, we hypothesized that ureteral obstruction triggers an inflammatory response that causes long-term tissue remodeling and fibrosis. And second, we hypothesized a systemic inflammatory response that affects the contralateral unobstructed ureter. We then decided to explore the inflammatory response triggered by unilateral ureteral obstruction if unilateral ureteral obstruction affects the contralateral unobstructed ureter and explore uh, the impact of COX-2 and microsomal prostaglandin E densitase 1 um, inhibition during unilateral ureteral obstruction. We employed a murine model for unilateral ureteral obstruction, um, which our work group has previously um, worked with. We used a non-traumatic vascular clip like the one lying um, on the gauze and place it on the distal portion of the ureter to induce complete obstruction. In total, we randomized 88 mice to controls. In those mice, we harvested uh, the ureter without prior surgery, two days of, of, of obstruction, seven days, and seven days of obstruction uh, followed by a clip removal and um, recovery period of eight days. 
During recovery, we did an ultrasound of the kidney on day two and seven after cliff removal. We then analyzed obstructed and the contralateral unobstructed ureter. We administered a COX-2 and MPGAS, a one inhibitor in the mice that underwent obstruction for seven days and seven days plus the recovery period. The model induces hypernephrosis consistently and impairs ureter peristalsis. On the left is an intraoperative microscopic view of hydronephrosis marked with a star and hydroureter um, here with the arrow caused by uh, this mentioned non-traumatic vascular clip, which has been in place for seven days in this mouse. Uh, ureter obstruction significantly reduced peristaltic, um, the peristaltic rate. And after clip removal on day seven, um, peristaltic peristalsis recovered partially. COX-2 and MPGAS inhibition did not accelerate the regeneration of peristalsis. Um, in those mice that were randomized to the recovery group, we performed ultrasonic imaging on day two and seven after clip removal. And consistently with previous results, mice developed a grade four hydronephrosis as visible on the left side. On the right side is a plot showing the volume of hydronephrosis on the y-axis. The degree of hydronephrosis increased um, significantly despite clip removal. Again, COX-2 and MPG-1 inhibition did not accelerate the resolve of hydronephrosis. Next, we evaluated uh, the histology of normal obstructed ureters. These are high magnification pictures of our first attempts to cut those um, tiny tissue samples. We observed morphological changes in the obstructed ureters. On the left is a very um, is a representative histology of an unobstructed mouse ureter. Next are obstructed ureters for two days, seven days, and on the right, seven days plus the recovery period. Um, we do see um, an increase of the diameter and in seven days and seven days plus recovery, an increase um, of thickness of the muscle layer and also hypermia in the samples that were obstructed here to here. And there's plenty here. And also um, infiltrates of mononuclear cells in the adventitia layer. These are high magnification uh, images of the um, urethelium. On the left, again, is an unobstructed ureter with the uh, urethelium, a thin lamina propria, muscle layer, and an adventitia, which is almost not visible. Um, and we do see that urethral obstruction affects the integrity of the urethelium. These are high magnification images of the adventitia and uh, there's infiltrates of mononuclear cells after two days of obstruction, seven days and seven days plus the recovery period. This is actually a perivascular lymphocy uh, lymphocyte infiltrate. Um, and there's also hypermia present again and erythrocytes in the um, tissue. These are a high magnification serous red stains. Um, this is a characteristic, they show the collagen distribution um, and it's um, in the lamina propria and adventitia layer and very almost not visible between the smooth muscle cells. With obstruction, uh, we do see a fibrosis of the lamina propria, an increase of um, collagen deposition in the smooth muscle layer and <laughs> um, a lot of fibrosis in the adventitia after um, 15 days. We try to objectify these histological findings and develop the grading system, evaluating ureth uh, urethelial integrity, fibrosis of the lamina propria, muscle layer, and adventitia, um, leukocyte infiltration of the lamina propria, adventitia, and um, hypermia of the lamina propria and adventitia. On the y-axis are um, the scores, zero indicating no changes and three indicating severe changes. And on the x-axis are the different conditions. 
control, two days obstruction, seven days, and seven days plus the recovery period. We do see trends here, um, but um, also due to the limited sample size, the only significant changes are present in the lamina propria and adventitia concerning leukocyte infiltration and hypermere. Um, cytokines and chemokines are important drivers of inflammation and involved in immune response. Considering our observations of increased leukocyte infiltrates in uh, ureter obstructed tissue, we analyzed the presence of cytokines in the tissue during obstruction. Uh, first, we used an antibody-based microarray um, on the left, this is it, to test the hypothesis of different cytokine and chemokine concentrations between obstructed and unobstructed ureters. Unsupervised hierarchical analysis of those results showed a clustering of obstructed and um, non-obstructed ureters, except for this one outlier. Consecutively, we performed a more comprehensive immunoassay based on Luminex technology. And we observed different cytokine patterns between the groups, clearly clustering of the samples um, according to their condition. The greatest difference was observed in seven days plus recovery compared to all other conditions. Control and two-day contralateral ureters were most similar. Just the seven-day obstructed ureters were um, scattered, scattered here. As previously mentioned, a subset of mice um, that underwent obstruction for seven days received drug treatment with a COX-2 inhibitor and MPGS inhibitor, unsupervised hierarchical clustering of cytokine and chemokine concentrations of those samples showed no clustering between the groups. I chose a few cytokines and chemokines from the immunoassay to highlight. The y-axis shows the concentration on a logarithmic scale and the x-axis the different conditions. Um, again, control two days, seven days, seven days plus the recovery period and contralateral unobstructed ureters from mice that underwent obstruction for two and seven days. Markers of T-cell recruitment um, were increased um, and also um, increased with the duration of obstruction and interestingly also in contralateral ureters like IL-16, um, TARC, or um, also um, MDC. These are other chemoattractants such as eotexin, fractal kyane, IP10, MPC5, Exodus2, KC, LIF, MIG, and interleukin-2 um, that were also increased during obstruction and for some even the contralaterals. Interestingly, uh, for some cytokines, we saw that they were only increased in the seven-day contralateral ureters, like IL-1-alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, IL-10, an anti-inflammatory cytokine, and also IL-15. As we observed, um, leukocyte infiltrates in the submucosa and adventitia layer and found an increase of pro- and anti-inflammatory cytokines and chemotractants, we then decided to do immunofluorescence to further explore the cell types that are involved. Uh, we focused on two things, T cell differentiation, um, Th1, Th2, and Th17, and macrophage polarization, M1 and 2. Um, just shortly in general, um, M1 macrophages initiate the inflammatory response, and M2 macrophages indicate um, the resolve of inflammation, tissue repair, um, and fibrosis. Th1 cell cytokines induce the polarization to M1 macrophages and uh, Th2 cell um, cytokines induce, the, um, induce M2 polarization. These are low magnification images um, of immunofluorescent stains with the antibody for um, M1 macrophages, which is, which is CD163 and Th1 cells, which is TBAT. Um, I, will, uh, I will show you more high magnification images later on, but we also already see that there is some positive um, TH1 cells and um, frankly here some um, M1 macrophages. These are the high magnification images with antibodies for um, T cells, CD3, 
for Th1 cells, Tbed, M1 macrophages, um, Th2 cells, and M1 macrophages. Um, these images show um, T cells, um, Th1 cells, and M1 macrophages in all obstructed ureters and also in the two-day contralateral ureter. Uh, we also observed Th2 cells um, in the obstructed ureters and um, M2 macrophages uh, in the um, seven days and 15 days obstructed ureters. 15 days is seven days plus the recovery period. Um, in general, those M2 macrophages are associated with a pro-fibrotic activity. Seeing that we observed major histological changes in the obstructed ureter, including the high degree of hydronephrosis, we ran a second Luminex assay, including matrix metalloproteases. Um, and they, uh, they are known to be involved in tissue remodeling um, through degradation of extracellular matrix. TIMP1 um, inhibits MMPs and promotes cell proliferation. It was increased in uh, the obstructed, but also in the contralateral ureters. M2, 3, and MMP2, MMP3, and MMP8 were increased in obstructed um, ureters, and in case of MMP2 and 3, also in the contralateral ureters. Okay, um, let's discuss the results. So in line with published data, we saw that obstruction triggers tissue remodeling and fibrosis of the ureter. Those findings are apparent on a histomorphological level as fibrosis of the muscle layer and adventitia. We add to uh, this current knowledge with immunofluorescence and the immunoassay findings. Consistently, uh, we observed type 2 macrophages um, in the seven days and seven days plus recovery samples, which indicate a shift from an inflammatory to a pro-fibrotic stage. M2 macrophages um, um, secrete chemotrectins like MDC, TARC, and eotexin, um, and they were increased during urethral obstruction. Um, also, MMPs and TIMP were increased in the immunoassay. From a clinical perspective, these findings suggest that the ureter's function might be impaired in long-term following obstruction due to fibrotic changes. Um, inflammation in obstructed ureters has not been studied before. We observed that obstruction triggered inflammation um, visible on a histomorphological cellular and molecular level. We saw hyperemia and leukocyte infiltration in obstructed ureters, Th1, Th2 cells, and macrophages in the obstructed ureters, and lastly, an increase of chemotractins and inflammatory cytokines in the immune assay, such as MIG and IP10, um, and those are expressed by M1 macrophages and attract Th1 cells, and also interleukin-2, which is involved in T cell differentiation. We conclude that, um, that the inflammatory response of the ureter to obstruction contributes to fibrosis. In the past, we hypothesized that there might be some sort of crosstalk between ureters. These assumptions were based on previous experiments from our work group. Um, we observed a decrease in the peristaltic frequency in contralateral ureters after 48 hours of obstruction. And similarly, the paper on electrical propagation in obstructed ureters that I presented early on saw a change of peristaltic frequency in the contralateral unobstructed ureter. Although our findings showed no histological changes of the contralateral ureters, our results suggest that during urethral obstruction, the contralateral ureter might be affected to some extent. And we found T cells, Th1, Th2 cells, and macrophages type 1 in the contralateral ureters, and also an increase of inflammatory cytokines, MMP2, 3, and TIMP. Lastly, COX-2 and MPGAS inhibition during obstruction. Well, this was actually the core of my initial project, but it turned out that in our study, COX-2 and MPGAS-1 uh, MPGAS inhibition did not show beneficial effect on obstructed ureters neither on resolve of hydronephrosis and regeneration of peristalsis, nor histologically or on a molecular level. The ratio for administering these inhibitors was that um, COX-2 and MPGS inhibition expression 
is upregulated in obstructed ureters and urinary PG2 levels are increased in obstructed ureters. PG2 um, has also been shown to be involved in orthoperistalsis. Results from studies on bone obstruction suggest that COX-2 and MPGS1 inhibition might improve regeneration of bone motility after obstruction. Our study has several limitations. Um, we employed an animal model of obstruction, um, of complete obstruction. Um, however, the most common cause for upper urinary tract obstruction are urethral calculi. And although we don't know for sure, urethral calculi are more likely to cause repeat temporary partial obstruction. Therefore, we should translate those results carefully. We used a clip to obstruct the ureters. Potentially, it causes a foreign body material response. It might have induced uh, ichemia by clamping small vessels. Instead, other work groups have ligated the ureter. However, the pro of the clip is that uh, the pressure applied is consistent and it is removable. And lastly, there might be a systemic inflammatory response just to the surgery. We conclude that urethral obstruction leads to an inflammatory response triggering fibrosis and likely impairing urethral function and possibly affecting the contralateral unobstructed ureter. Dr. Tu kindly provided, provided me with a CT scan from a patient. Um, it shows the extreme effect of hydronephrosis um, due to um, an obstructed, uh, obstructing urethral stone. Um, we see um, a big stone burden and a loss of renal parenchyma. Clinical implications. <laughs> um, um, so hydronephrosis and hydrogeotary conditions are likely dependent on the degree and duration of obstruction. Ultimately, hydronephrosis um, leads to acute kidney injury and chronic kidney failure. Fibrotic changes of the ureter might impair ure ureteral functionality um, and thereby contribute to persistent hydronephrosis and contribute to chronic kidney disease. In, um, in those cases of acute obstruction, pain usually demands timely retreatment. There's little data on the impact of short-term obstruction on the uh, ureter's function. This is a work by Barber and co-workers um, they showed that six to seven weeks after ureterinoscopic stone removal, 8% of patients present with transient hydronephrosis without anatomical obstruction. And, um, but hydronephrosis resolved in all patients at six months. There are studies on renal function after acute blockage, and they report a risk of chronic impairment. Keller studied um, the renal function in 76 patients with acute uh, renal obstruction, and they performed renal scintigraphy uh, within 24 hours um, of admission of the patient. In 14 out of those 76 patients, they showed a decreased renal function in scintigraphy, and after three months, two out of those 14 had persisting impairments. These results uh, suggest that there is um, there, there's limited long-term damage after short-term um, obstruction and stone treatment. This study it deals with the outcome of silent urethral stones and their impact on kidney function. Obviously, those patients um, for those patients, we do not know the onset of urolithiasis, um, but chronic obstruction is very likely. In this study, um, Marcini and his co-workers prospectively selected patients for silent stones between 2006 and 2014. Um, stones were uh, discovered during imaging for another reason, and um, patients underwent um, stone treatment up subsequently. 26 patients met the inclusion criteria, and renal function was evaluated again by scintigraphy at diagnosis. Um, patients were then followed up, followed up at uh, three months and 12 months, and the 12 months included a second renal scintigraphy. 
Patients with uh, silent urethral stones presented with a significant impairment of the ipsilateral renal function in 70%, 77%, and also hydronephrosis at diagnosis. Um, renal impairment was irreversible. The plots on the left show that serum creatinine um, the GFR and renal function and scintigraphy did not improve during follow-up. Uh, hydronephrosis, however, significantly improved um, from preoperatively to three months postoperatively, but not from three to 12 months. So the question remains, remains um, how much obstruction can the ureter deal with in long-term? Um, to what extent a loss of ureteral functionality contributes to kidney damage? And further clinical questions are if urethral stenting causes um, a similar uh, response with long-term damage of the ureter. And um, well, in future, can we mitigate urethral damage and fibrosis to protect kidney function? In future experiments, we will assess the inflammation in stented ureters. Um, we consider stenting a partial obstruction of the ureter uh, with regard to the ureter and hypothesize that there might be um, similar inflammatory pathways that are triggered. As we can do not stand mice, we stented ureters of pigs for 14 days. And these are first results from the standard pigs. Um, on the right is a high magnification image that shows an increased immune activation and with a nest of immunocompetent cells um, and also hyperemia. With regard to um, fibrosis, we did a serious red stain of a control ureter, which was not stented, and a stented ureter on the right, and observed um, an increased deposition of extracellular matrix in the smooth muscle layer. I would like to finish off by thanking the main contributors to the project, Dirk, Dr. Tu, Dr. Cox, Philippe, and Hanet. Thank you very much for guiding me during the project and helping me um, with the in vivo experiments. And lastly, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions and feedback.